This is Jack Ketch, the worst executioner in history. <laughs> It's the late 17th century, the English Restoration, an era rich in writers, scientists, architects, leaders of their fields. And then there's Jack, who's famous in his profession too. Famous, that is, for being the very worst. In fact, he's so known for being the most blundering, incompetent executioner in England that the name Jack Ketch has been slang for not only the devil, but also for death itself for the last 300 years. So, who was he? Well, we don't know what Jack looked like or really very much about him at all. He was probably Irish and started out as a hangman. And this wasn't just a case of pulling a lever and watching your prisoner fall to meet a quick neck-snapping end. Most prisoners executed on the infamous tree at Tyburn died not of a broken neck, but of slow strangulation. And yes, that was as grim as it sounds. While you might think it would take no more than a few minutes, being choked to death in this way could actually last an incredible, agonising 45 minutes. And as a hangman, it was part of Jack's job to tie knots to either speed up or prolong the agony, depending upon who he was hanging. Horrible hangings aside, Jack's enduring reputation actually resulted from the parts of his job that required a more butcher-like approach. As unpleasant as slow strangulation sounds, one of the very worst punishments of the time was reserved for those found guilty of treason. That was being hanged, drawn and quartered. For men, at least. Hanging, drawing and quartering entailed being hanged by your neck until you were choking but not unconscious. The rope from which you were hanging would then be cut, causing you to fall coughing and gasping to the ground. You would then be dragged onto a wooden table and while still almost fully conscious, your penis and testicles would be sliced off and your stomach carved open. Your executioner would then plunge his hand inside you and draw out a handful of your writhing, spilling intestines. They'd be flung, along with your privates and other organs, into a nearby brazier or vat of boiling water. Then an axe would be brought down to sever your head, after which your body would be roughly cut into quarters and the pieces distributed across town to be displayed on busy thoroughfares as a warning to potential lawbreakers. To make these bits last longer before they started to decompose, they would first be parboiled in pitch, and it was part of Jack's job to carry out this gruesome task from his HQ at Newgate Prison, which chillingly became known as Jack Ketch's Kitchen. So Jack strangled, dismembered and preserved, and then he beheaded. By the time Jack was responsible for this, Chopping off people's heads was a method of execution mainly reserved for the nobility, as it was seen as a more dignified end. However, the axe had a reputation for not being particularly efficient at decapitating. In earlier centuries, specialist beheaders had been employed to do the job. Anne Boleyn had requested a French swordsman, just to be certain of a clean, quick death. But Jack didn't use a sword, he used an axe, and it was two terrible beheadings in particular, his dreadful aces in the hole, that really made his name as the worst executioner who ever lived. The 21st of July, 1683. William Lord Russell has been sentenced to death for treason against King Charles II. Before he makes his way to the scaffold, he hands over between 10 and a massive 30 guineas to Jack in exchange for a hasty, painless death. But it was not to be. Jack takes at least three strikes to sever Russell's head. The first of these misses the neck entirely, striking Russell on the shoulder. The second cuts partly into the neck, and it is the third or fourth which finally kills him. An account of the grim spectacle goes as follows. Ketch wielded the instrument of death, either with such sadistically nuanced skill, or with such lack of simple dexterity, that the victim suffered horrifically under blow after blow, each excruciating, but not in itself lethal. The execution was so shocking, even to a bloodthirsty 17th century crowd, that Jack was forced to write an apology to excuse his appalling technique. But was it sincere? 
Well, no. He chose to lay the blame squarely on Russell himself, stating that Lord William had failed to dispose himself as was most suitable, making poor Jack distracted while taking aim at his neck. Ah, so it was all Lord Russell's fault. The 15th of July, 1685. James Scott, first Duke of Monmouth, an illegitimate son of King Charles II, has been sentenced to death for leading the Monmouth Rebellion in a treasonous attempt to overthrow James II. The Duke is nervous to say the least. With Lord Russell's execution still fresh in his mind, the last thing he wants is for his to follow suit, to be slashed to pieces and fully conscious while it happens. He gives Jack six guineas, considerably less of a bribe than Russell. As he hands the cash over, Monmouth says, do not serve me as you did my Lord Russell. I have heard you struck him three or four times. My servant will give you some more gold if you do the work well. Monmouth tests the edge of the axe with his fingers, anxiously remarking that it doesn't seem all that sharp. He is right. The resulting fiasco is a barbarous bloodbath. Horrified onlookers reported it took five chops to kill Monmouth, while some said it was as many as nine. After the first blow, Monmouth struggles to his feet and looks up at Jack reproachfully. Jack strikes again, but Monmouth is still moving. After a third strike, Jack unbelievably downs his axe in frustration, not wanting to continue, before being ordered to get on with it. Two to six strikes later, and the Duke is finally dead. But there's a problem. His head is still attached. The only thing for Jack to do is to pull out a knife from the sheath on his hip and saw across the last cords of sinew and flesh that prevented the head from dropping to the floor. One eyewitness of the bloody fiasco said that Jack's performance had so incensed the people that had he not been guarded and got away, they would have torn him to pieces. So just why was Jack so spectacularly rubbish at his job? Was he just a bodger, a blunderer, the Frank Spencer of capital punishment? Well, Jack was known to be a rather unpleasant chap. He had a taste for booze and was often drunk both off and on the job. He constantly clashed with the authorities over how much he was paid, especially for his work quartering and boiling bodies. And Lord Russell and the Duke of Monmouth were not the first to offer a bribe in return for a swift and pain-free end. Many did. In fact, Jack was earning quite a sum pocketing these little, and not so little, backhanders from prisoners. He could also have made money selling off pieces of the condemned themselves, as well as fragments of their clothing and small lengths of the used nooses. These could be flogged off for as much as a shilling per inch, a possible origin of the phrase, money for old rope. Jack was finally released from duty in late 1685, and in January 1686, was thrown into the Bridewell prison for assaulting a sheriff. The year after bodging Monmouth's execution so badly, he was dead himself. But that wasn't the end of Jack Ketch. The notoriety that began in his lifetime quickly became the stuff of ghoulish legend, a legend which still lives on to this day. He was the subject of ballads, poems and broadsheets. Just as there had been a Jack Ketch's kitchen, Jack's name was used to describe other things too. A Jack Ketch's Pippin was the candidate for the gallows, a noose was known as Jack Ketch's Necklace, and a large slum near Clerkenwell in London, Jack Ketch's Warren. Within a generation of his death, the character of Jack Ketch became part of that most disturbing of puppet shows, Punch and Judy, as the hangman punched tricks into hanging himself. His gruesome shadow also looms large over a host of literature, from the 17th century right up to the present day. Jack prolonged suffering on the gallows while his victims choked for life. He butchered bodies, boiled body parts, and painfully hacked to pieces those deserving of a quick death. His story plays to our deepest and darkest fears and encompasses some of the most brutal punishments in human history. It's no joke that he remains in our imagination over 300 years later. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Historics. There'll be more coming soon, but in the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, please do like, subscribe and share. 
See you next time.